Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Inspiring Brains podcast with Nick Thielen. Um, my guest today is Kevin Rempel, and Kevin is a 2013 uh, sledge hockey champion and a, a 2014 Olympic bronze medalist, as well as a, a public speaker and an author of the book uh, Still Standing. Uh, how are you doing today, Kevin? I'm doing awesome, Nick. Super happy to be here with you. Yeah, thank you so much for, for coming on the show. Uh, first of all, uh, I mean, I read your book and I, I really loved it. Uh, my one question for you is, is I read the book and I was just wondering, is there an audiobook version available uh, yet or is, is that, is that coming? Yeah, I, you know, it's on the list. It's on the list. Okay. And it, should, it should have been maybe been done a long time ago. So yes, I want to do it, but I don't have it out yet. Yeah, it's okay. Uh, well, I, I really enjoyed the book, but uh, so my question for you is, you know, you have a really, uh, really inspiring story and actually um, for, you know, we're all kind of in a weird situation given the the, the way the world is right now. And, uh, you know, so I, I, I always thought, you know, maybe I, I'd like to write a book myself or do something like that. But I was wondering, you know, you have a, you have a very, uh, you know, inspirational story in terms of, you know, going to the Paralympics and, you know, uh, learning to walk again and all that. Uh, but what, what would be your uh, piece of advice if anybody is looking to do that? I mean, because uh, what was the journey like when you were writing your book? Uh, advice on writing a book? Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, first question to answer is, I think, why do you want to write a book? Um, mm. For me, it was... I wanted to do it for myself, number one, because I felt like I had a story to tell. Mm -hmm. um, secondly, I wanted to write it for my friends, my family, and uh, I don't have any kids yet, but I'd love to have kids one day. And I thought that if I were to have kids and um, for something to happen to me and they not grow up and know who their father is or was, yeah. um, I'd love for them to be able to read the book. Mm -hmm. um, and then thirdly, you know, definitely I want to help people with that and uh, it supports the speaking career. So yeah. Uh, though for me, those were the three main reasons. It wasn't to get rich. It's just uh, something that I personally wanted to do and um, to like share the story and add value to help other people. Yeah. Were there were there particular challenges you had when going through the writing process? Like, you know, obviously you're going through some pretty personal memories when you're writing it. So I had a book coach. Uh, his okay. name is Les Kletke. And I think his website, if it's still kicking around, is Global Ghostwriter or just lesklepke.com. Mm -hmm. And uh, what was so powerful is that he had a, a process and a framework for me to follow. And so okay. I can even like the framework of my book is um, without getting too far into detail. Basically, every chapter has uh, four sections, which is intro, story, reason, impact. OK. Um, and you start each chapter around 2000 words. And then each of those sections is 500 words. And you just okay. break it down. So like tell me 200 words about the phone and tell me 100 words about the water bottle. And then yeah, 300 words about um, the keyboard mouse anyways. And then you just write, you just write right. it, however many words about that thing. Yeah. That seems like it would be a much more like manageable process, right. In terms of like looking at it as this, uh, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a big task to take on, but taking it into these little like absorbable chunks is a little bit easier to, to, to grasp. Um, yeah. That's the, that's the idea. Like, you know, as a, as a speaker, my story is about the, or my keynote is titled the hero mindset. Mm -hmm. and focusing on three key areas uh which are accepting responsibility taking things one step at a time and never giving up yeah uh, we have hero moments decisions and actions and so those moments we recognize in our life that regardless of what's going on that we mean we may not be responsible with, for what's happening to us yeah. but we're always responsible for what we do about it so that's right. the first step yeah then the second step around uh, making a hero decision to take things one step at a time is to break things down into small baby steps mm -hmm. And, and the third area is uh, focusing on hero actions, which is when you choose to show up persistently, never giving up in pursuit of your goals or your dreams. Yeah. And so when you take the book as an example, you know, this can seem like a monumental project. How am I ever going to start? Mm -hmm. uh, so accept responsibility. I just got to take the ownership to break this down into small, simple steps. And so that's each chapter is 2000 words and 500 words. And then how many words per that object? Um, and then persistently show up every day. And then that's that's an example of applying the hero mindset to writing a book. All right. I, I appreciate that. Uh, I, I was wondering, you know, your story, you uh, so you had your accident when you were 23. Am I correct? Yep. OK. And, and I was wondering, did you play um, stand up hockey prior to your injury at all? Yeah, I did. I did for about yeah. five years when I was a kid, but I was okay. not good. Not good at okay. all. 
but my, my, my question is because I have cerebral palsy and, you know, that's something I have from birth. But do you feel like playing uh, stand-up hockey at all helped you um, to be able, like, you know, playing hockey and then uh, finding sledge hockey and eventually making the Paralympic team? Uh, yeah, 100%. Because, you know, in the Paralympic world, there's many athletes that, uh, like, have never played that particular sport they joined, let alone yeah. played sports, period. And they can go on to excel and become world-class athletes. However, with with sledge hockey and the team uh, specifically, like I know that I had an advantage over some other players because I came in to the sport with hockey as a background. So I knew positioning, I knew plays, I knew the language. But we definitely have had players come through that never never set foot on the ice, um, and they've reached uh, an elite level. But right. definitely, like having a background played an important role in, in growing and accelerating really quickly. Right, because like for example, I played and I played just casually for fun. But uh, the, the thing I struggled most with was like raising the puck and that whole like I'm sure like you know having having you know fired pucks before and and uh, played the stand up level kind of you know helps a little bit with that aspect of it. But what do you, you think? Know, you know, just in sled hockey, I get asked a lot about raising the puck as an example, and it's like. And it took me two years. Like I, I made Team Canada, but it took me two years yeah. of just shooting the puck at the boards over and over and over again, right hand and left hand, because I knew I didn't want to be able to just shoot one handed only. Right. Um, but it takes time, man. It takes time to like develop the wrist strength. Um, it takes time to like understand how to twist the wrist properly, how to follow through, and it just takes time. You got to keep right. practicing. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, yeah, I mean, I I, uh, I really enjoyed playing. I never, I mean, I had the chance to uh, to get coached by uh, by Derek Whitson when I was living in uh, in Medicine Hat for a while, and that was a really cool experience. Um, and in your book, you particularly talked about uh, getting getting lost. I believe it was in in South Korea at the airport. If if you uh, uh, well, I think yeah. the story. I remember you mentioning like the story. Um, Derek and I were on our way back in Japan to the hotel. Okay. And uh, we, we left as a team to go to, a, uh, I forget the location. We went as a team to like go to a temple as an example, and then yeah. had the um, opportunity to like split up in groups and go back. And on the way back, Derek and I were just wandering and I decided I wanted a haircut. So I got this haircut and uh, ended up, we ended up getting back late for dinner. And um, it wasn't like the end of the world, but I also knew that we were definitely in shit. And uh, <laughs> that was another moment where I had to accept responsibility that right. I knew I was responsible for getting back late and uh, mm -hmm. but also like pretty simple but fun memory from uh, traveling to japan C can you put into perspective like because i've never played at that high of a level what it was like um training for team canada and and maybe to add to that what how that varies from what you would do now as like a regular workout obviously it's probably not as intense but it's probably still a regimented workout yeah uh it's like most athletes. I mean, so if you can imagine the three to five, like, well, five days a week training uh, leading up to the games at seven days a week and yeah. just find different forms of therapy. Um, like it took a lot of, yeah, so just a full-time commitment. There's a lot of athletes that still have part-time or full-time jobs, which is very hard to juggle. So I was fortunate. I was able to commit full-time to, to sport. Yeah. Not paid off. Um, but where my life is today you know, the differences between what, how I trained today and how I trained then is like, then it was very sport specific, um, you know, uh, an extraordinary amount of core work, um, an extraordinary amount of uh, shoulder rotator cuff, um, strengthening your, your back. Whereas okay. now I approach my workouts differently to, you know, to maintain an overall well being versus just that upper body, let's say. Yeah. Um, I'll give you another specific example. It's like never in my life have I ever thought that I would enjoy hiking. Right. But today, you know, I spend more time. <laughs> this is, I don't know. This is going to sound really funny. It's like, I feel like I spend more time standing up than I do sitting down in the sense okay. that like when I played sledge hockey, all my strength came from sitting down. Yeah. Like that was what I needed it for. But now yeah. like I care more about having um, a strong, my, my strong hips and strong, uh, legs in the sense that like, I don't want to have knee pain. I, I deal with knee pain a lot. So a lot of my workouts these days are more on the lower body. Whereas before it used to be a lot on the upper body. Yeah. But so when you were playing and preparing, uh, do you feel like, 
I'm not, I'm not sure, but I feel like from uh, being being in Ontario and, and you know being closer to to the U.S. border, kind of, uh, did you was because especially uh, you know when you're probably training for the for the uh, Olympic team, there was there a lot of like teams or people to compete with, or did you have to find? Did you just have people that you worked out with regularly? Yeah, we, like I I'm very fortunate. Ontario is the hub for sledge hockey in Canada, yeah. and I moved from Niagara to Dundas, which is by Hamilton and which is, you know, 30 minutes away from the best players in the world, especially at, yeah. that, at that time. So mm -hmm. it gave me the ability on a regular basis to get on the ice with Greg Westlake, Brad Bowden, and Billy Bridges, um, you know, Adam Dixon. Wow. And, and those were the guys who I practiced with yeah. on a weekly basis. Um, so that, that helped me, that helped accelerate my growth tremendously. And, uh, if it wasn't for that and also having like some, you know, the club teams are what make the sport um, yeah. exist. And the Mississauga Cruisers is my local local team. And so, you know, Ken Hall was is a phenomenal guy and he kind of took me under his wing too, which kind of gave me the, the pathway to Team Ontario. And so mm -hmm. just, you know, started local in Niagara, moved to Dundas, joined the Mississauga Cruisers, made Team Ontario and then Team Canada. It was just a... Uh, it was a somewhat of a quick path, but it was also just getting, you know, surrounding yourself with the best players possible, like dramatically increased my, uh, my growth. Yeah. Sorry. I also forgot to add this on the bottom here. It just has your, uh, some website information, your website and your Facebook and Twitter, if people want to follow you. Um, but that, that's a, that's a big aspect, I think of, of, of your journey. I, because I, for me being in Alberta, uh, it's, it's great. And I would, you know, anybody, if they're if they're interested in sledge hockey, doesn't mean uh, that that you can't make it from another province. If you're from another, you know, if you're from another city, doesn't mean you can't make Team Canada. I just know that from like there's a lot more uh, you know travel associated with uh, you know trying to get that organized, and then you know uh, there's not there's not as many players in a, in a in a you know a, a, a city, I guess. So we all have to you know I've I've played in a couple of tournaments and. Uh, some of them have been like, um, you know, just it'll be like three or four players from this city and three or four players from that city, and we'll all come together to play a tournament. And and uh, as strange as it is, it's also really wonderful because you know, uh, it's it's just that com camaraderie of like coming together and and playing and just having fun. And and uh, that's what I loved about it. Uh, I also yeah, played absolutely. some uh, some sledge or some uh, some wheelchair basketball as well which was which was great uh pick, picked up that a little bit faster so i enjoyed it a little bit more but but uh yeah i mean just this just the chance to uh to, to get active and and for me you know being somebody that's always had a disability it's uh just sport in general and being able to feel like i'm kind of gives a sense of like normalcy right and, oh totally so, yeah as, as good as i am walking around on my two legs every day and most people would never know there's nothing wrong like i especially when I started, um, yeah. there was that feeling of community, like you said, of normalcy and, uh, ex you know, hanging out with peers on a shared journey. Yeah. It's uh, extremely important to well-being. It's just like, it's happiness, it's health, it's um, community. And it's not just for the players, it's for the parents as well that have, have the, uh, the children or the, or the brothers or the sisters or the aunts, the uncles, like it helps everybody. So going through the journey of, of recovery uh, from, you know, uh, your injury and then, and then what, what were some of the things that like doctors told you, for example, because I'm not sure, like, did they tell you that you, you may be able to walk again or what, what was their words when you, when you started that doubt? Uh, what I remember verbatim from the doctors three days after I wake up out of surgery and he guy comes in and says, uh, Kev, you're, you're now an incomplete paraplegic and you likely never walk again. And if you do ever walk again, you'll have braces on your legs to your hips the rest of your life. Mm. So at that point, um, I wasn't pissed off. I mean, I definitely had a little bit of that screw you attitude in my mind, but um, mm. I just, the immediate thought that went through my head is that you don't know me and you haven't given me a chance yet. And I'm yeah. going to keep getting better and put in the work as long as I can, as hard, as much as I need to, to see how far I can go. And when I stop getting better, I, I will decide for myself at that time that that's where I'll be. But I'm not going to let, um, in the words of Les Brown, when he said, he's like, I'm not going to let someone else's opinion become my reality. 
Yeah, yeah, and I, and I, I, that's that's important, I think, too, because for me personally, you know, I, uh, you know, I'm being born with the, the cerebral palsy, and then uh, going going through those challenges, you know, the doctors told told me or my parents that you know they didn't think I'd be able to. They thought I'd have to go to a special needs school and wouldn't be able to keep up with the regular curriculum of school, and then uh, let alone pass. And then I went from there to you know going to university, getting a degree, and and you know I, I do web design myself and kind of try to start my own business and stuff like that. So I think uh, you know it's all, like I think the the uh, it's important that you know whatever. I guess the the limits the doctors try to put on you. I don't think they're really limits. I think you're. I, I think we ourselves are the only like limits of what we can accomplish. I think, you know, it's, it's the mindset I think is important. And. Yep. Yeah. The yeah. mindset is extremely important. And I think there are areas in our life and in the world where, you know, I mean, you just generically speak here, like maybe scientifically this X, Y, Z thing is not supposed to be possible. Yeah. Uh, like I'll give you an example, like the difference between myself and my dad who had an injury for the audience who's listening, my dad had a, a spinal cord injury four years before I did when he fell from a tree in a hunting accident. Um, but my dad was deemed a complete paraplegic and I was deemed an incomplete. And, okay. you know, as a, someone who has a complete injury, meaning it means that you've basically like cut your spinal cord or you've severed it in a way that, you know, scientifically haven't found the solution yet for that to reattach and someone to heal 100% and get walking again. Yeah. So... In my case, I was very fortunate that I um, just fractured and dislocated my vertebrae. I, I um, pulled and pinched my spinal cord and then surgery realigned it. And so there's a lot of bruising and swelling and pressure around the area. And then with time, that started to slowly go away. And that's what gave me the opportunity to heal. And, I, and so I say with a little bit of luck and a lot of hard work, I was able to get better. Right. But, you know, had I like cut my spinal cord, I can't say that my mindset would overcome my spinal cord being cut, but, but yeah. the, the message is, is that regardless of what's, what you're experiencing or what card you've been dealt is that mm -hmm. you still have the opportunity and the ability to accept responsibility, uh, to decide what you want to do with that hand that you've been dealt. Yeah. And you don't need to let someone else's opinion dictate what your life is going to be like. And so yeah. you need to choose what do you want your story to be? Yeah. Another thing that I do personally for fun is I do stand up comedy. And I found that has been a really great way for me because I went through school and uh, did creative film and all that sort of stuff. But I found, you know, stand up comedy is kind of that release and uh, a way to promote and, and to tell my story and, you know, be positive about, you know, disability and totally. uh, and make people laugh, which has been super cool. Um, and again, like, yeah, prove people wrong, which is which is super cool. Cool. Uh, but I, I guess, you know, I've been through a lot of, you know, the physical struggles and I used to be in a wheelchair. So now I walk with, you know, one or two canes, depending on where I am. And I can walk when I'm at home and I trust where I am. I walk without support if I can. But um, but I think for me, the most important or the, the, the thing that I find, a, you know, kind of a, still a daily challenge is is like you said, that uh, that that mental strength. So what kind of things did you have to go through? Like, uh, as an athlete, especially, uh, and to keep training, keep doing what you're doing, uh, that that sort of that mental fortitude uh, to keep going. Is there a specific like minds or things that they go through, as well as like the physical aspect of it that they teach you about? Uh, well, not, as far as like who they are, who teach me or, about. I mean, like, I'm not yeah clear on that but what I can here's what I can share with you is you know from my life experience um, what I've discovered are there's three key areas that really help maintain my mental strength and, and my resilience mm -hmm. um, throughout the pandemic that we've been living through I've spent time to develop what I call the resilience toolbox and it's something that supports my my keynote about the hero mindset uh, because the mindset is about the mindset about the inspiration but then the toolbox that surrounds it is all about the ap application and so if we were to think about or we were to discuss, you know, what what makes up the hero mindset and mm -hmm. what are those tools and key areas, uh, the, the, the three key areas, um, number one is to create your own belief, um, to think about 
you know, who is it that you look up to? Uh, what are the resources that you can tap into so that you can um, gain that knowledge? As well as what are a few writing strategies to help you um, clear your mind and, and get clear on what you want? And also like to reframe any negative thoughts into positive thoughts. Okay. Uh, yeah. The second key area, so first creating your own belief. The second is around mental mental conditioning. Um, it's all about focusing on, on your habits um, and making resilience visual and, and setting your, and setting some uh, short-term and long-term goals as well. Because what I discovered is, you know, it's one thing to be motivated on a, like every now and then on a random day, but you want to be able to uh, maintain your resilience through mental conditioning. And so when we create something as simple as a vision board or a quote board, um, you look at the habits that you have in your life and how you can shape those and then set short-term goals, we can show up every single day um, with energy. And instead of feeling um, lethargic, we can feel lively because we have something that pulls us up out of bed. Right. And then, so we look at, so first pillar number one is uh, creating your own belief. The second uh, the second is um, mental conditioning. And, the, and then the third key area is around self-care. Mm -hmm. And what that encompasses is just um, simple uh, nutrition, um, sleep, and exercise because it's – one thing to like be driven with goals, but if you're burning yourself out on a regular basis and you don't have the stamina or energy because um, you're feeling lethargic, you're you know you're eating like you're eating garbage, um, you can't think straight because your cognitive ability is now affected. Mm -hmm. All of these uh, different areas make up a, a wholesome mindset, a wholesome body, a wholesome yeah. spirit. And so, what I've discovered is that. For me to maintain my mental resilience, to have recovered from all the challenges of losing my father, um, overcoming paralysis, to excel at high-performance sport and get through post-Olympic depression, is that all of the tools and strategies that I um, found to be the most useful were, were tools and strategies that I had already at my fingertips in my home that I could implement at any time that cost no money. And so that's what I focus on is, is on... Um, what I, the resilience toolbox is cognitive behavioral therapy techniques, um, yeah. simple tools and strategies that you can apply and then just set yourself up, both your mind, um, your body and, and your spirit as well, in the sense that you show up every single day, pulled up, up, pulled out of bed to go after what you want rather than trying to find a way to push yourself up out of bed. And that's a great answer. I mean, uh, I apologize if I'm a little bit, um, it's a little bit darker here because my light automatically goes off, but I, I think I can still see myself. So I'm, I'm, I'm all right with this, but, um, I wanted to ask because, um, you know, uh, specifically when we talk about uh, hockey and, and, you know, we talk a lot of people talk, you know, NHL players nowadays are, you know, a full like head to toe kind of taking care of yourself. So I was wondering, you know, kind of that that, that was a great answer. But I was wondering, you know, that mental aspect for for somebody from the, you know, sledge hockey perspective. So that's why I asked. But um, I, I wanted to ask a little bit if you if you can at all describe that that feeling of 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 going to the olympics because i personally in, in 2010 i was an olympic torchbearer which you know kind of gave me that you know brief kind of meaning of because uh, yeah. you know you, you talk about the olympics and what they mean and and it's it's a totally different perspective to watch it on tv of course it's exciting to watch it on tv but it's a totally different thing to be part of it in some way and, and to feel like uh there's some some aspect that you've helped to to make those games happen and uh I sp specifically you know i kind of tell a funny story uh you know when i when i do stand up you know when i when i was carrying the torch it was in red deer and it was in the final leg of the uh, relay and at that time i was recovering from a uh, foot surgery and uh and i wanted to i i was uh i think i was asked to be a part of the relay after somebody had uh had backed out and so i was told you know fill in the application and go through the process and, and, you know, you'll be, you'll be a part of it. Right. And so that was great. Uh, but, uh, but for me, you know, going through that, uh, uh, recovery, I, I knew I wanted to physically carry the torch myself. They gave me some options to, you know, put it in a wheelchair and have it behind me or walk beside somebody as they held it. And I was like, no, 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 if I'm going to do it, I'm going to hold it myself. But, and so I was walking very, very slowly because at that time I was still recovering. But uh, and the the joke I tell and what I you know is that I was wearing you know the 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 flannel kind of pants or whatever it is and it's a flaming butane torch and part of the part of the uh, 
500 meters or whatever I did, you know, you're wearing these uh, gloves and it's obviously very hot. And so I kind of like lost grip of it and it dangled between my legs. And then I managed to like flip it back up. And it was only that like after, after my leg of the relay that I realized the entire relay itself was being played on this giant jumbotron screen in front of like the entire city. Yeah. So, so, I mean, that was kind of a cool moment for me and meeting some very, very like amazing. With that? Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. It's a unique uh, story that I don't think anybody can replicate. So that's, <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, so, and I, and I met some really cool uh, athletes that have participated in previous Olympics, but can you put into words kind of that, that Olympic, what that Olympic experience was like. Yeah, it was just, you know, dreams come true. Dream come true is, is one for sure. Mm -hmm. You know, after everything that happened and, you know, any athlete working long-term towards a goal, it's, it's a, a dream just to get to the games, let alone medal in the games. Yeah. So, you know, that, that was very rewarding. And, you know, I think back, I got to live all of my childhood dreams that I aspired to achieve through motocross um, mm -hmm. through sledge hockey. So that was pretty cool. Like paid to travel the world, you know, elite athlete, um, you know, playing on the world stage, that kind of stuff. And, and I just yeah. really appreciated like the experience from a point that like, you know, being a part of a global event was pretty cool knowing that the whole world's watching, um, the support from everybody to send notes and messages was, was so rewarding. And, uh, sharing the medal is also like part of the experience that, uh, is really yeah. important to talk about. It's, you know, coming back home uh, for the viewers, I could show it here real quick too. Like um, this is the uh, championship ring yeah. from winning the worlds in 2013. And then uh, here's the, uh, the bronze medal from Sochi. And uh, I don't know what's going to show up real clear there. Yeah, yeah. I got to hold, uh, I, I got, well, I got to wear uh, Derek's medal briefly when, when I, played with him and it, it, it's a lot heavier than you think uh but yeah, yeah. this focus is not going in back no 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 that was that was good for uh focus wise it was good yeah no. yeah so like sharing sharing the uh the medal is is a big part of the experience as well it's not just like getting a bad day it's like you know it continues to inspire others that mm. uh they can go and achieve their dreams and yeah. it's also given me a platform too which is really really a blessing to build a life and career after sport and, and to continue to continue to share the story to help inspire others. Yeah. And I mean, you talk a lot about the, the kind of commitment it takes to, to be a uh, Paralympic athlete and, and to prepare for it. And, you know, of course, not only the Olympics themselves, but the whole lead up to it, it's essentially like a four or five year commitment. Right. But, or even more than that, because you're preparing and you well, have you're to, in four -year oh, cycles. Yeah. Uh, I guess, but it would also be, it's a lot more of you just, of course you have to like qualify for the team and make the team. Uh, but, but I was wondering, can you, um, from, from, um, you know, speaking to, to different people and, and inspiring a lot of people throughout your journey, do you, what has it been like since, uh, 2014? I mean, I know, I know that sledge hockey itself, especially, after you know 2010 having a, uh, Olympic Games at home that was a big part of it as well but uh, I think throughout the last like 10 years that sledge hockey has grown a lot and uh, but what, what have you seen yourself from from speaking to people and how, how have you seen the sport grow? Every year it's better um, I mean Vancouver did a lot and then had we won gold in 2014 or 18 that would have been amazing to catapulted even further but you know every four years it's noticeable how much how many more people know what the sport is when you do when you describe it to them how many more people have seen it and yeah. we have um more more players getting involved as well there, there's been moments where i know we are going through some dips and right now the world's not helping um, a disabled sport or paralympic sport in any way get bigger but um I believe I, I personally I've been saying for years and I strongly believe we're going to have a tipping point where something's going to happen that uh, it's going to be like all in. We're going to have tons of support, tons of awareness. And um, I mean, really, you could even argue that coming out of the pandemic that we're in, like right now, who even knows if 2022 is going to happen, let alone next summer games. Yeah. But, you know, 
if it's not those ga- those years, it's going to be the next. It's going to be twenty twenty four, sorry, tw- and twenty twenty six. That like when the world resumes, people are going to want this. They're going to want sports. They're going to want to mm-hmm. have the next best games ever to reca- like to rekindle the fire after all of this is this has gone down. So, you know, let's say and shoot, man, it's not that it might be six years away, but let's say 2022 is canceled as well. And it's 2026, but 2026 could be the year that like Paralympic sport, the Paralympic movement just completely explodes because yeah. the world's coming out of, uh, the, they want they just want to showcase it. And so there's, I believe there's going to be a tipping point one day that, yeah. um, our sport gets what it needs as far as exposure and support. And then we'll have a lot of players involved create that greater depth of talent and then it's just gonna go up and up and up yeah. and i know that like tara chisholm the, the coach of the women's team and, and and derek whitson have been huge in promoting like the, the women's aspect of of sledge hockey so i do think that once the women come into the game as well it shows another aspect of it and how big it really is because i, I don't think that's really i don't think people are as aware of that right now um but um but my 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 thought too i was wondering for you what you think is um because there's there's obviously a challenge with uh there's, there's a lot of support behind and a lot of obviously financial and, and a lot of people supporting the the olympics like the 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 able-bodied olympics i guess you'd call them and the paralympics but what do you think is that is the is the challenge of why it's maybe not as as big or broadcast on national tv around the world uh my my personal opinion is that well it's not just because I think it should be right. I, I especially during uh, Vancouver 2010, the, the CBC was saying, "Oh, we don't think that people will be interested in this," and there's quite a backlash of that. But it's politics, it's business, it's sponsorship, it's marketing, it's uh, economy. I think there's, there's, you know, the older I've gotten, the more you start to understand like why things are the way that they are, and not whether it's right or wrong. But I'll give you a, a perspective. Like a, this is not anyone else's, but my own words. But just looking at it from a business perspective that when you operate a business and you only have X number of dollars available to invest somewhere, you want the biggest return on your investment possible. And so businesses and they know that the Olympics will have a higher reach than the Paralympics. So that's where they put most of their money. Right. However, you know, especially as we, as the world and as more philanthropy happens and more businesses are actually, shifting their values from ROI in terms of dollars to ROI in terms of, um, how do I say it? Like, um, consumer in- engagement okay. or their values, you know, that's forever. What's been so special about the Paralympics and the Paralympic movement is that yeah. there's better brand alignment there than I think there is anywhere else. And there's so many opportunities, especially at a very low cost. And yeah. so, you know, there's, there's, business economics to take into account. Um, there's economics as far as the athletes themselves. It's like maybe an athlete has a great story, but are they a great speaker? Do they have a good website? Do they have a brand built? Like mm. as a Paralympic athlete myself, I think I've done a really good job. Um, when you look at the landscape of as far as someone who has um, shared their story personally mm. through social, built several websites, yeah. spoken for years, and I still struggle to, I still struggle then, especially to get the support or recognition maybe that I wanted. Uh, so I'm just kind of giving another perspective. It's like, you know, the athletes in the sport, we all want more, but we also at the same time need to provide assets, basically, is what they are, and resources so that if someone's going to invest, they're not just slapping a bumper sticker on your on your chair or your sled and right. giving fifty thousand dollars like what can you offer in exchange for Show that the return so you know we may not be able to offer the return as far as exposure with the number of thousands or millions of followers um or the viewership because we're the best athlete or the best sport that's going to be the most watched but what could you as an example i'm even for anyone listening like you know could you do meet and greets could you do a day on the ice or a day on the court with some guests could you do um, a VIP dinner? Could you do a day talking at um, your sponsor's kid's school? Um, you know, there's so, 
could you do private videos, five video updates per year to show a personal connection beyond just writing a check? Like there's our sport and our athletes, we all want and, and are asking for more and deserve more from these sponsors and businesses. But at the same time, they're saying like, okay, well, we'll, let's say we'll invest, but what are we going to get more than just doing a good deed? Like we still need an ROI um, and that's fair to ask for. So, you know, trying to mirror the two. And and I think just with time and the economy too, like that's where um, it's been shifting in the right direction since 2010, every single four year cycle, like now we're broadcasting over the internet. So, you know, our sports and sledge hockey, especially in 2018, I think, I don't know, I don't remember the numbers exactly, but especially when it comes across the internet, like we were able to watch every single game mm. and every single game live. And like, that wasn't possible years prior. So it's all moving in the right direction. It just continues to take time. And, and the internet is, is the best opportunity for um, broadcasters to continue to like connect and share and um, help our sport get exposed. At the same time, athletes need to take advantage of the opportunity and not just sit there and hope that we're going to get tossed some money, but using the internet actually creates some value so that they want to invest in you. Right. And it seems really like I can, I can kind of tell from my perspective that, that, that you know, reading your book and uh, you know, talking about the, you going to school and, and, and taking your marketing degree for the purpose of creating your dirt biking website and magazine and that kind of thing. I feel like that, um that degree obviously now as a as a professional athlete and, and building your own brand and public speaker and all that sort of thing is absolutely huge in terms of sort of giving a, a leg up in terms of branding yourself and uh and yeah yeah one thing i would say like um not to knock my education in any way um the brand building and stuff and marketing like that just came through real life experience um, through trial and error as the internet and social media came, became a thing. But what, what college mm -hmm. did for me that was really cool is, you know, we, I was in um, a computer class in, in my marketing program. And back then we were learning how to build websites using HTML code. Like you put in like yeah. hashtag 0004 or whatever, and that would be the color red. And then you'd have to like put in another code for how long you want that square rectangle to be on the screen. And then you, yeah. it was crazy how basic it was. Yeah. But, but from that, what happened is it taught me how to build my first website, which was a dirt biking website. And then I built my second, third, fourth. I've built like six websites. Yeah. And then a... that's what's given me the, you know, the platform to start to like have a platform on the internet. And that, that came from, from marketing. Yeah. It's crazy. Cause I went through kind of some similar basic, uh, web design courses and, and the very basic like HTML code. It's crazy to even think like, uh, how difficult it is to get like, you know, obviously the color, but then well, not not difficult. I would say it's 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 the so simple, but the action of like going on a website and clicking a button, obviously like to code that yourself. I mean, it takes a lot more than you would think, and uh, I, I don't think people realize that unless they go through the process. But um, I wanted to 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 see. I know you uh, talk about on your on your website on the blog there. You, you're uh, one of the things you're heavily involved in now is the. Uh, the sledge hockey experience, if I'm correct, the, you know, yep. having other people come out and, and, and try the sport. Um, I was just wondering, you know, obviously there's a big commitment uh, to becoming a Paralympic athlete. And, you know, uh, if, if, you know, this is, I mean, I, I don't know if you, if you would be interested in, in doing another Paralympics or if you're interested in that, or if, if you're, if you're busy with your business now, which would make total sense. But I was just wondering, um, do you ever do you see yourself like uh, um, becoming a coach or giving back to the sport in that kind of way or any any other any other ways you see yourself kind of giving back? Yeah, yeah. I mean, well, right now the business. So the business is a way of giving back in the sense that like I want to help grow the sport, bring those sponsors in because all the work that I do is with corporate. So my, my mission is to help bridge the gap between the disabled population and the able bodied population through the sport of sledge hockey and help give the able body population a uh, perspective on both life and people with disabilities. Yeah. And so that's been phenomenal to, you know, open the dialogue, create the conversation, <coughs> excuse me, to open the dialogue and create the conversation. And it's open doors for uh, fundraising as well. Like we've, my, my the business I run and with my team, we've together in the, in the three years, we raised $32,000 and bought 30 sleds for kids, uh, yeah. sled sticks and hockey gear. Yeah. Um, so I do want to continue to do more of that. 
um, as far as coaching, I think yes, one day, but like not in the near future. And I just want to continue to make this business tick first. Right. Um, and then with the pandemic right now, it's, you know, it's closed and definitely not closed permanently. Uh, mm -hmm. but I'm just, uh, focusing on the speaking and then it's going back to sledge for a second too. It's like, I put out a bunch of instructional videos a few years ago. I, I spent a ton of money, um, not mm -hmm. expecting a return on my investment. I just wanted to do it because I wanted to do it, but um, I know that I want to do more and I want to now with the education I've, ex I've got from trial and error, mm -hmm. uh, I will be building more content, uh, that'll mm -hmm. likely come in a form of a course that you could probably purchase, um, yeah. some specific tactics and tips about getting better in sports. So, um, to coach behind a bench is not in my near future, but, um, continue with the business to continue to fundraise for kids and then my third step was be would be to continue to um, put out content online through video form, uh, through blog formats, so that uh, people can continue to learn how to play. Right, and uh, I guess w one last question I want to ask before before I kind of let you wrap up here. But my, do you think now, um, given that it was a it was a few years ago when you were part of the Paralympic team and and uh, you know trying to make the team, do you think it's much more difficult now if you were to try to make the team, especially considering that, you know, there's a lot more people playing it, but I've also kind of heard that, um, you know, uh, there's a lot more like speed in the game now. Um, do you think it would be a lot more difficult now or how's the, how's it changed? Do you think? Yeah. Uh, I think that's accurate. Um, the speed has increased significantly in every four year cycle from 2010, 14, 18, and, and today, yeah. um, the, our team in particular, I mean, I'm not on the, I haven't been on the team for five years, but I know yeah. that, um, the, the testing is a lot more, um, how it's like a lot more detail oriented, a lot more frequent, a lot higher standards than it used to be. Yeah. So that said, you know, I think, you know, I, I, from watching the team before I was on it to when I was on it and then since I've been on it, you know, there's, there's always pockets. I mean, there's, there's waves of players coming through. Um, right. Depends on, it depends a lot on the individual, you know, yeah. their, their head, their, where they're at mentally, as far as understanding the game of hockey, as well as their um, physical ability and or disability, you know, like yeah. you might not be the quickest, but um, if you got the hockey sense, like you can make up for it just yeah. through smart plays and, and good hands. So I, the sports, of course, elevated. Um, the talent, um, I want to say, does get deeper. It always needs to be more, you know, at the at the elite level. Um, I always personally, if you look at the roster of, like, say, 16 players, I think that the, the bottom four players on the roster always have – there's always an opportunity to take a spot. Yeah. Uh, yeah, like – six this, the depth of talent across 16 players is not equal yeah. um so if you're on a, if you're the up and an up and comer it's like it's not unrealistic for you to crack the roster yeah and once you're on the team then you just got to keep working your way up the roster and as opposed to like wheelchair basketball where they have the point system right there's no there's no point system in sledge hockey so um you know some people might have more mobility and things like that and i also see people like i played uh basketball with like Liam Hickey too. And I know he plays sledge hockey as well. And, you know, being a multi-sport athlete, I think, you know, you kind of get into that, must, must get into that regimen of just like how to treat your body all the time, make sure you're eating the right things. And so having yeah. people like that come through and, and then mentors like you or other people that, you know, have done it before is probably being a huge asset to growing the game. So. Yeah, absolutely. Just what you said too, but like, um, one of the biggest takeaways I got from sport is learning how to look after myself, um, developing the, the discipline and the routine for working out, you know, yeah. especially during the, the pandemic, you know, working from home, not just working from home, but like working out from home, even for myself, um, can be difficult, but it's yeah. from my sport background that has given me a lot more discipline and routine and know what to do, um, to show up as many times as I can. You know, my, my minimum is like three days a week. I aim for five. doesn't always happen. But um, that's one of the best things that sports gifted me is to understand the importance of exercise, sleep, and nutrition 
so that uh, you're at your best every single day. And so the last thing I kind of wanted to, to, to let you talk about is um, what you're working on now. I think you briefly talked about it with your the, the, the toolbox and what you're working on now, given the, the pandemic. But I want, I want to give you a minute to, to, to let people know what you're talking about now and where they can find out more about you. I know I've got the website going on the bottom and Facebook and Twitter, but anything you'd like to talk about uh, that you're working Thanks, on now. Yeah, I appreciate it. Uh, yeah, just as I described, the Resilience Toolbox, uh, it will soon be available. It's a set of cognitive behavioral therapy techniques, 15 plus tools that you can just pull out of your backpack at any time when you need uh, a strategy to support you with mental resilience. Um, the best way to stay in touch is probably through Instagram is where I'm most active, just at Kevin Rempel on Instagram. And the website is perfect that you have on the screen as well. Um, I'll be launching a brand new website, hopefully in no less than four weeks. And and from there, you'll be able to access a webinar about the toolbox. Yeah. Um, you'll see a lot more resources and uh, go from there. Right. Awesome. Well, I know, and uh, people can can get your can get your book as well on Amazon. And uh, there's a, there's a free ebook as well if you're interested in an ebook. Uh, but yeah, uh, obviously, uh, I just want to thank you very much for your time. Just being, I, I really appreciate the fact you're such a down to earth guy and give me a little bit of insight into what it's like to be you and to get where you've been. So uh, congratulations on all that you've accomplished. Um, thank you for sharing your time with me. It really means a lot. And uh, all the best to you uh, with, you know, the pandemic and everything you're working on. And uh, yeah, hopefully uh, once this all kind of blows over, maybe uh, I know my plan is to come out to uh, to Winnipeg. I've never really been out East, but I'd love to come out East and do some stand up. especially I have a lot of friends now that I've, I've met and so my plan is to kind of go out that way and do some uh do some tell some jokes out there so maybe uh if we ever got the chance to meet in person that'd be really cool hell yeah man i'd be stoked to and i appreciate you uh, asking me to join you on the, on the show so thanks for having me on okay thank you so much uh have a good day and uh yeah appreciate it